Thank you this morning. Good uh, singing, and I'm glad to see you here today. Thanks for being here. It's Labor Day weekend, and everybody's enjoying all of that. Hey, let me ask you a question, all right? Uh, have any of you ever what I had what I call a close call? Uh, something ever happened to you and you think, man, maybe, you know, I just missed dying or having some terrible accident or something like that. It's ever happened to you? It's happened to me a couple of times. I, several years ago, back before I was preaching here or anything like that, my wife and I went on vacation. We went to Hawaii and uh, I had tried to talk her in. We were on the island of Kauai and I tried to talk her into going on a helicopter ride. I mean, I like to fly. I've got, I've got my private pilot's license and I enjoy flying. So I told her, I said, they got this helicopter that flies all over the island of Kauai and it flies down inside these old volcanoes and inside the mountains and down along the beach and the coast and all that. I said, it's a lot of fun. I'd actually done it a long time before and I tried to talk her into it. And my wife's idea of flying is she likes to quote the verse out of the Bible that says, and lo, I am with you always. You know, it's, and she emphasizes that low part, okay? But uh, I finally talked her into it, and we made reservations to take the helicopter to her on, on one of the mornings that week, and we were going to go and do. And then late the afternoon before we were supposed to take this helicopter ride, my wife just sort of chickened out, and she said, no, 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 we ain't going to do that. So I got on the phone, I called the people, and talked them into letting us out, and they gave us our money back and all that kind of stuff. So instead, we decided to go uh, riding down the coastline line on one of these uh, motorized rubber boats and that's pretty fun too you get to see all that and so we left that morning we drove down there and we got in that rubberized motorboat with the other uh, cowards that didn't want to fly and uh, we started going down the coastline and we got down a little ways and uh, we saw the helicopter uh, because it was all going around the same place. And we saw the helicopter take off and it came flying past us. And I punched my wife. I said, see, I could be on that helicopter right now if it wasn't for you. And we, but I said, oh, no, no, we haven't. I didn't want to ruin the whole day. So I said, but we're having a good time. This is great. But we saw the helicopter fly by and do all that. So we spent the whole morning out on the coastline having a good time doing all that. When we got through, we went back to our hotel to change and to get ready for what was going to do that afternoon. And while we were changing, I just sort of, uh, out of habit, turned on the television. And uh, there was news on, and there was a news bulletin. Turns out that this helicopter we were supposed to have gotten on had crashed that morning and everybody on board had died. Now, you want to talk about the ultimate, I told you so. Buddy, I got it. I'm my, I, if I listened to you, we'd have been dead, you know. And then she's going, I'll never listen to you again as long as I live. And she has kept that promise religiously <laughs> since that day. She really has. But uh, I, I, I remember sitting there watching that. It's sort of a spooky thing to see that. And it really, it sort of hit me. I said, man, you know, we, if we hadn't have called, this could have happened to us. And, and I remember thinking, Lord, you know, if, if you wanted to bring me home, you just missed a real good opportunity to do that. I mean, you could have just snuffed me out and brought me home right then. And it wasn't much longer. I, I was, uh, this is, I had a secular job and, and uh, I was working down in South Florida and I was actually driving up to Tallahassee and I was driving up Interstate 75 and I had to go through Gainesville, which, you know, for me is hard anyway. But uh, we were driving through Gainesville on it. I was. I was alone. I was driving. I had a Dodge Durango and I was driving north on Interstate 75 and it had started raining. I'm, I'm not talking about thunder and lightning pouring down, but it was raining pretty steady, just enough that the roads had gotten pretty slick and pretty wet. And so I'm driving up the interstate doing speed limit and I'm driving about 70 miles an hour and, uh, uh, and 65, whatever, and I'm driving and I wasn't texting. I wasn't talking on the phone. There was nobody in there to talk to. I mean, I had both wheels on, hands on the steering wheel. I'm just driving. And all of a sudden, my tires just started hydroplaning on the highway just out of nowhere. And I just started sliding. And my car went into a spin. And just, if you can just see me and that Dodge Rango going north on 75, and it just started doing circles. Just in a, and there was nothing I could do. There was no traction between the tire and the road. And he was just spinning, 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 spinning. And finally, the back part of the tire
tire hit the edge of the side of the road and then it just started sliding backward as hard as it could it slid down into the gully deep down into the mud and, and the tall grass is about this high and finally came to a dead stop with me pointing toward all that traffic coming this way and man I was sitting there my hands were shaking and I was trying to get my breath and I got out of the car and I looked around and behind me about five to ten yards right behind me was this big huge steel barrier before you got to an overpath and it dawned on me another ten yards and I would have hit this concrete barrier and who knows what would happen to me and then I looked in front of me and uh, you know about 200 yards or so down there with, with all these trees you know like a forest in between the two highways and uh, and I realized man I, there was just one gap between those trees and the concrete that I just happened to slide in and get in there and I was just standing there again I was going oh God really you must really want me to live because this would have been easy you know if you blinked your eyes I could have been out of here and uh, we ha I had to call a tow uh, company to come out and get me and tow me out because I couldn't get out I remember when that tow truck driver got there he looked at me and said you one lucky dude and I said, well, I think there's got to be more to that, man. I said, I don't know about your faith, but I believe God's just watching over me and protecting me. But I remember walking away from that, and I thought about the helicopter thing, too. And I was just going, you know, God, you obviously are leaving me here on this earth. And you're obviously leaving me here for a purpose. And, and I want to make my life count. It doesn't have to be in the newspapers. I don't have to have the lights. I don't have to be on television. But I want my life to count. You've chosen to let me live and chosen to let me be a part of this world. So I want my life to count for you. And I want to make a difference. This morning I want to talk to you about this. Are you willing to make a difference in the world in which you live? I mean, all of us sitting in this room, uh, we're going to talk about this this morning, but God has made every one of us and shaped us in a very specific way. And God has a special work and a special plan for everybody in this room. Nobody excluded. And what we want to talk about this morning is, am I willing to just give myself to God for Him to be able to use me to make a difference in the world? In Inside your bulletin, reach in there and pull out some study notes. I provided some study notes for you, and I, there, there ought to be a pen around somewhere in your seat. And to pull it out, I want you to jot some things down this morning as we talk about this subject of are you willing to make a difference in the world? And, and the key here, let me give you the starting point to all of this. The starting point is I have to be willing to let God use me to make a difference. And the key word there is willing. So uh, just fill this in there in your blank. My heart has to equal my willingness. There has to be a willingness in me to say to God, I am willing to let you do whatever you want to do in my life to make a difference. In the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, these are the words of Jesus. Now, it's up on the screen. It's inside your bulletin in your study notes. So I want to ask everybody to read this out loud with me, would you? Let's read off the screen. Jesus said, if people want to follow me, they must give up the things they want. They must be willing to give up their lives daily to follow me. I want you to circle the word willing there. That's the key. I've got to be willing to whatever God wants to do. For me to give up my life on a daily basis, I've got to want. That's another key word in that verse. I've got to want it. I've got to be willing to let that happen. So, what does a willing heart look like? What do I have to do to really be willing to let God use me? There's a great story in the New Testament. Maybe you've heard this story. It's, it's, it's a popular story in the New Testament about Jesus coming to a town called Capernaum. It had actually become his headquarters town. Now, Jesus was from Nazareth, but not far from there, right at the top of the Sea of Galilee is a little seaport fishing community called Capernaum. 
Egypt, you can go there today and see all the ruins. Today, there's the ruins of a synagogue where Jesus actually preached in this synagogue. And there are the ruins of a lot of houses that were right there in front of the synagogue. One of those houses was Peter's mother-in-law. And you can actually see where that is. And in this little community, Jesus had sort of set up headquarters and was using that as a base to travel all around the Sea of Galilee and all over the Galilee area to preach and to minister to people. He had been gone for a while and he decided just to come back to Capernaum. It was sort of like a surprise stop back in Capernaum. People didn't really know that he was coming. So let's pick up this story. It's a neat little story. It's found in the book of Luke chapter 5 and it's uh, verses 17 through 28. I want you to try to get this picture. Try to imagine what it would have been like to be there. Here's what it says. One day Jesus was teaching. He, he was in a home, a house right there in front of the synagogue. And it says, and the Pharisees and the religion teachers were sitting around. They had come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea. Even as far away from as Jerusalem. So people had come from everywhere. It's a long trip. Uh, from Capernaum to Galilee, especially if you have to walk or ride an animal, but they were all there. You've got to get this picture. Jesus is inside this house. He's teaching. He's talking to everybody there. People are packed. They're hanging in the windows. They're hanging out the door. They're gathered in the little streets there. Everybody's around to hear what Jesus has to say. And then it says, some men arrived carrying a paraplegic man on a stretcher. They were looking for a way to get in the house and to set him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, removed some tiles, and let him down in the middle of everyone, right in front of Jesus. Impressed by their bold belief, Jesus said, Friend, I forgive your sins. Now, I like this part. It says, that set the religion scholars and the Pharisees buzzing. Uh, th uh, they said, uh, who does he think he is? That's a blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. So it ticked them off. That Jesus, they, they weren't worried about the guy being sick. They weren't worried about the crowd. Uh, they were just trying to catch Jesus doing something wrong. And so they said to him, nobody can forgive sins except God. And I think probably Jesus is back to his mind going, y'all about to get the point. That's what I'm trying to say. I, that's me and I can do this. But what's the rest of the story? It says, Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. Does that part make you nervous? It, it should. Jesus knows exactly what we're thinking. Right now, sitting in church, he knows exactly what you're thinking. Here's what he says. Well, just so it's clear that I am the Son of Man, that I am authorized to do this, he now spoke directly to the paraplegic. Here's what he said. He looks at this guy laying down on a stretcher and he says, get up. Take up your bedroll and go home. And the story says, without a moment's hesitation, he did it. Got up, took up his blanket, and left for home. Giving glory to God all the way. The people rubbed their eyes, incredulous. And then they also gave glory to God. Awestruck, they said. We've never seen anything like that. I love this story. It's a great picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus can do in people's lives. But what I want you to notice in this story is how just a few people can make a profound difference. Here are four guys, four friends of a paralyzed guy who brought their friend to Jesus and had to do some extraordinary things to get their friend in front of Jesus. I want to use this story to share with you four truths that we need to understand if God is really going to use us to make a difference. I want you to write these four things down. Uh, I, I think God's going to use them to speak to us this morning. So uh, get ready right now. Four principles that we need to know if we want God to really use us to make a difference. Here's number one. If I want God to use me to make a difference, number one, I've got to be willing to let my life be interrupted. Let me say that again. I've got to be willing to let God interrupt my life to stop me from doing my thing and do his thing. Now, I told you, 
This was not so much a planned trip. Jesus had stopped back in Capernaum and sort of impromptu had a teaching service. And these four guys heard that Jesus was in town. And uh, they had a friend. Now, I don't know what these four guys were doing. The Bible doesn't say. But you know they were doing something. I mean, it's a fishing village. They might have been down there fishing. They might have been out in the fields working. Uh, it might have been Labor Day, and they were home going through their wife's honeydew list, you know, doing all these things they should do. I, I don't know what they were doing, but, but I, I know they were doing something. But when they heard that Jesus was in town, they stopped what they were doing and they went and got their sick friend and brought their sick friend to Jesus. Now here's the point I want to make. They were willing to let their plans and their agenda be interrupted so God could do his thing in their community. They were willing to put their lives on hold and let their plans be interrupted so they could bring a friend to Jesus and have his life changed. I read through that and I thought about this interruption and how these guys were willing to let their lives be interrupted so God could do something. And so I went back and I looked at the life of Jesus throughout the New Testament. You know what I noticed? Jesus' life was a constant interruption. He was always being interrupted. I read one of those stories where one day Jesus was preaching to a crowd of people and he was sitting there talking and uh, while he was teaching to all these adults, a bunch of children ran up to Jesus and they started pulling on Jesus and talking to Jesus. And when he did, there were some deacons over there, I mean, I'm sorry, some uh, people, uh, disciples. They came running over there and they grabbed all these children and they started pulling them away and said, hey, y'all can't bother Jesus. You can't interrupt him now. He's teaching. He's preaching. Don't, don't bother him. Let's, let's, let's back away. And Jesus heard them. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. This is fine. Matter of fact, he used the children to teach a point. He said, unless all of you get hearts as tender as the hearts of these children, God's not going to be able to work in your life. You need to drop that hard, cold heart and let Jesus give you a tender, soft heart. And, but it was an interruption. And Jesus was willing to let that interruption happen. I remember one time Jesus was preaching. I read about this. And a blind man showed up wanting to be healed. Another interruption. I mean, all of the healings of Jesus were basically interrupted. Matter of fact, every funeral Jesus went got interrupted. Because he kept waking the dead guy up and giving him life again, you know. I'm, it, Jesus would just had a way of interrupting funerals. And, but everywhere he went, there was always interruption. Even in this story, it was an interruption. He had the house filled with people, all these dignitaries from town. He was sitting there teaching them. And suddenly, in the middle, they had a roof leak. I mean, the roof opened up and all this hay and stuff starts falling down. And they lowered their friend down on this mat in front of Jesus. Another interruption. He couldn't even get away to be by himself without interruptions. On several occasions, the Bible says he was preaching to the multitudes. And then he said, I'm going to withdraw and go away to pray. And then it would say, but the people followed him. And he ended up having to talk to him. Guys, here's my point. Constantly, Jesus was being interrupted. Now, here's the point. Everybody listen. And, and I don't think this is in your notes, so just write it down the old-fashioned way, okay? Jesus saw an interruption as an opportunity for him to do ministry in somebody's life. Now, most of us don't like interruptions. Let's be honest. If you get on a project, if you sit down to do a task, you like to finish that task. You don't want your kids. You don't want your spouse. You don't want the neighbors. You don't want the phone. You don't want anybody interrupting you while you're focused on the task. But for Jesus, when he had an interruption and people interrupted him, he saw that as an opportunity to do something great in somebody else's life. Now, here's a principle I want to give you. Get ready. I want you to write this down. My availability becomes God's opportunity to minister. Okay? My availability becomes God's opportunity to minister. 
So, so guys, I wanna, what I want to ask you this morning is, are you willing to let God interrupt your plans so he can do his thing? I mean, you're, you're busy. I, I, let's make this as simple as we can. Tomorrow's Labor Day. Probably a lot of you have tomorrow off and you're not going to be working tomorrow. So you probably got your plan, what you want to do tomorrow. You're going to go to the beach or you're going to the mall or, or, or you're going to go play golf or, or you're going to do a bunch of housework or yard work. You just sort of got your plan. Probably you got a plan and your spouse got another plan for you. But I don't know. You got a plan for tomorrow. Now you wake up tomorrow and you start on your plan and in the middle of that, you get a phone call, you get a knock on the door and then somebody will with a problem, somebody with a need, and you know if you get involved in that, it's going to be an hour, maybe a couple hours, it's a serious interruption. Are you willing to be interrupted so that God can use you to minister in somebody else's life? So I want to just put a question out there for you to think about this morning, okay? Here's the question. And uh, I, I, I've got a blank at the end of this question. And I'm not going to tell you what to write in that blank. Because only you can write it. Here's the question. What keeps you from being available to God to use? What is it in your life that keeps you from being available to God for him to use? Now, I can't fill that in for you. All I can do is fill that in for me. You may, you may know right now what it is. You can write it in there. Or you may have to wait and fill it in this evening or sometime this afternoon after you've thought about it. But there's so many things, you know. I've got my agenda and what I want to do with my life. And, and, and sometimes God wants to interrupt and do it a different way or do something different. I've got my plans. I think there's one word that, that I could use to, to come up with what keeps us from being available. It would be the word distractions. There are a lot of things that can distract us from God's service and being used by God. Let me just give you some examples. Work can make you not available to serving God. I mean, all, all, all we workaholics in the room, listen up to me. We get so task-oriented, so busy working and on our projects, we're so tied up in what we're going to do that we don't have time for a co-worker who stops by our office and, and, and has a problem and needs somebody to talk to. Or we're so busy with what we're doing that we don't have time to, to volunteer at church or to volunteer somewhere else because we're way too busy working and work has become a distraction. What about television? Some of us plan our entire lives around what's on TV. And we're not going to let our TV watching schedule get interrupted by having, you know, I can't be in that small group because that night's the night I watch this TV program. Or I can't do that. Uh, uh, I can't get in that ministry. I can't do this because I'm watching this on TV. It may be a boy or a girl that we've gotten obsessed with. It may be a hobby. Now, come on, it's just us. Let's be honest with each other, okay? Some of us spend more time on our hobbies than we spend on reading the Bible, praying, going to church, memorizing Scripture, and all that combined together. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a job, nothing wrong with hobbies, having friends, and all that. But when they become our pursuit, when they become the things that are most important to us, and we can't be interrupted in those things in order to serve God, then there's a problem. We're being distracted. Listen to what Scripture says. Jesus said in Luke 9, verse 62, listen to what Jesus said. Anyone who lets himself become distracted from the work I planned for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. So guys, my question for you this morning is, what is it in your life that's got you so distracted that God's not able to use you? You don't have any time, any resources, any energy left to be of service to God. What is it in your life that is distracting you from serving Him? I thought I'd share with you what I've, I've been pastoring a long time, most of my life. Here are the two biggest distractions I've seen in people's lives. Number one is what I'll call the pursuit of wealth. We're so busy in our lives 
trying to get more things and more stuff and make more money. Now again, there's nothing wrong with things and there's nothing wrong with money. Unless those become the object and the passion of our lives. And we're so intent on getting that new thing or making that next dollar that there's nothing left for God. Then that becomes a distraction. And I've got to be willing to let God interrupt me if I want God to use me. Here's the second thing. Not only the pursuit of wealth, but just the word busyness. Busyness has become the new buzzword for a lot of us. If you stop somebody and you're just talking to them, you say, how you doing? They'll say something like, I'm doing okay, just busy. Well, what have you been up to? Nothing really. I've just been so busy, man. And the truth is, most of us in this room are so busy. And one of our problems is we're so busy we don't have any time left for God. So God can't use us to make a difference in the world because we're so busy with everything else. Here's a principle. If you want God to use you to make a difference, God's agenda has to become your agenda. Let me say that again. If you really want God to use you in a great way, his agenda has to become your agenda. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. It says this, Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. I want you to take your pen or pencil and I want you to circle those two words, special work. And then I want you to underline the words, I set you apart. In this verse, we learn that every one of us, God has set us apart and called us to do some kind of special work. You say, Jack, I'm not sure what special work God has for me. Well, I'm glad that you said that because we actually have a plan to help you find out what that special work is. If you're new to Crosswater, we have four classes that are a base for us to help lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. The first base, we have a class called membership class. And in that class, we want to make sure that you've given your heart to Jesus, been baptized, and are part of a local church family. We call that membership 101. On second base, we have a class we call maturity 201. In that class, we try to teach you some basic Christian disciplines like how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible, what are the tools you need to study the Bible, how you can memorize scripture, Scripture, how you can meditate on Scripture. We try to teach you those tools that will help you to grow up. And then in our third base class, we call it Ministry 301. And George mentioned it a while ago. We'll be teaching that class uh, on the 23rd and 24th. That's two hours one night, two hours the next night. It's a four-hour class. And in this class, we help you find out what your spiritual shape is. Shape is an acrostic for this. S is we help you find out what spiritual gift God has given you. H, we help you find out what your heart or passion is, what you really like to do. A is your abilities. We find out what you're good at. And then P, we help you find out what kind of personality you have. Introvert, extrovert, that kind of thing. And then E is for your experiences. We look at all the experiences you've had in your life. We take that and put it together with a ministry profile so that you can look and say, this is the way God has uniquely made me. And then we have you meet with somebody who goes through that with you and shows you all of these ministries that it looks like God could use you in an effective way to serve him. It might be one we already have or it might be one that doesn't exist yet. Now, now I want you to listen to me, okay? Just stop taking notes for a minute and just look up here and let me share with you. Over in my office, I have a notebook with between 100 to 200 ministries that I believe God wants Crosswater to have. And we don't have most of those ministries. And I'm going to tell you why we don't have those ministries. Because we're waiting on God to, to bring people who say, my shape 
God has made me in such a way that I can do this ministry. And we help you build that ministry and start that ministry and get it going. I'm talking about all kinds of unique ministries. The other day, I was, uh, I stopped at the gate station up here to get some gasoline. And after I finished uh, getting gasoline, I went inside for a minute to get a donut. And uh, w- when I went in there, there was about 30 to 40 people who were all walking around. They had these helmets on and they had these skinny tight outfits on and shorts, you know, where they're sort of looking like, trying to look like Lance Armstrong wannabes. And they had all these special shoes on. And, and I saw there was these big bikers. They, and on Saturday morning, they had all gotten together. And, and I heard them talking about, we've already done 18 miles. And we only have, uh, I don't know, 10 miles left to go or something like that. And I looked at all these and I thought, well, why couldn't somebody who had that passion and that heart to do that start a ministry in our church for people like that? And they could get together and do that, but they could also pray and build each other up in the faith. I mean, guys, there are literally hundreds of kinds of ministries. And listen to me, all of those ministries are waiting on people within the body of Christ to say, I am available for God to use to make a difference in the world around me. Jeremiah said, God wants to set you apart for a special work and a special ministry. All right, now I got to get the second thing. If I want God to use me, I got to be willing to let my life be interrupted. Number two, if I want God to use me, I've got to be willing to change my attitude. I got to be willing to change my attitude. Now, Whenever I read a Bible story, I like to make it real to me. One of the ways I like to make it real is I like to sort of mentally become every character in that story. Now think about the story I just read to you. You got the guy that's sick on the mat. Think about what it's like to be him. You got the four buddies who carry in the mallet. You got Jesus. You got the scribes. You got the Pharisees. But this week, you know who I've been thinking about in this story? You know who I've been thinking about? The guy that owned the house. Think about that dude. I mean, things that, he's got a crowd showing it up at his house. And I don't know, but I assume this guy's married. Now, guys, you don't have to say this out loud because I know you'll get in trouble. But guys, what's your wife like when a hundred or so extra people show up at your house unannounced and uninvited? You better get over and clean that up right now. I'm telling you, you better pick your drawers up off the floor right now. And you need to clean that up in the kitchen. And you need to, we got company coming. You better do So I can just see them running around. They're trying to get everything ready. They can't fit everybody in. And then they get in there and everything's going good. And this guy that owns a house, he's walking around. This is a good day, man. He got everybody that's anybody is at his house. Probably the mayor's there, the rabbis, there, all these people at his house. This is going down good, man. Everybody's going to be talking about it. They were his house. Everything's going good and then he gets a roof leak. He's sitting there and stuff starts falling through the hole in the roof and he's looking up going what in the world and then all of a sudden there's a big hole and they lower this guy down in front of him and I'm just telling I'm not trying to I'm just being real okay I'm just being real. Don't you think the first thing that went through his mind was who's going to pay to fix that roof? I mean, that's going to be expensive. Somebody's got to do that. I ain't going to do that. You four guys, y'all going to have to fix that roof. But look, their attitude, cha- their attitude is not that way. Because they're willing, whatever, to see God use their house to use them in a great way. Okay? Whatever it takes. So I said a moment ago, if you want God to use you, God's agenda has to be your agenda. Let me say the second thing. If you want God to use you, God's attitude has to be your attitude. A lot of attitudes in this story. There's these scribes, there's these Pharisees that are being critical. There's a hurting, there's the willing, there's the helpless. A lot of attitudes in this story. But I know there's four guys and a homeowner that say, whatever it takes, God, I'm willing to provide it and give it to you. Let me, uh, let me read to you what the Bible says in Romans 15 verse 2. It says, we should all be concerned about our neighbor and the good things that will build his faith. My attitude's got to be, it's not just about me. It's not just about taking care of me. I've got to be willing to help my neighbor, my friends, whatever. 
Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, the scripture says this. People should be concerned about others and not just about themselves. And so for God to use us, we've got to have this attitude. God, whatever it takes, I'm willing to do it. So I ask you a while ago, what distraction is keeping you from being used by God in a great way? Now here's the second question I want to ask you. What attitude is it that's holding you back from being willing to be used by God? Is there an attitude in your heart that's keeping you from being uh, usable? Uh, some of you say, well, Jack, uh, I, I, I'm shy. I, I, can't, I can't get out in front. I can't talk. I can't do this. I, I'm shy. I can never do anything like that. Or some of you say, you know, you don't know my background. You don't know how bad I've been. You, you don't know all the things in my past. So God can't use me. My life is just too messed up. I got too many problems. God can't use me. And, and, and if you've got that kind of attitude, I just challenge you to read through the Bible and look at the people that God used. Moses greatly used by God. He said, God, you can't use me because I can't talk in public. You, you got Paul, who's not a great speaker. Everybody said Apollos was a better speaker than he was. And then you got Timothy. You want to talk about being tough? Timothy said, God, I can't use you. I've never been circumcised. And so before Timothy could really start ministering, he had to go have a little surgery. Now, can you imagine if we said, hey, you can't be a small group leader in our church till you go down there and, as an adult, have a, ha have a little circumcision down there. We wouldn't have a whole lot of hosts for small groups. I can tell you that. People wouldn't be signing up. But he says, you know, I, I, I'm not going to give that excuse. There's old Ananias who was old and, and said, my best days are gone, but God used him. There's Zachariah, Zacchaeus, you know, we little Zacchaeus. And everybody said, don't hang around him. He's a bad guy. He, he's a terrible person. But Jesus said, come on down from that tree. I'm going home with you today. There's a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, drugged through the streets in her shame, thrown at the feet of Jesus in a spirit of judgment. But God takes her and shapes her, makes her a beautiful woman of God. So I don't know what our excuse is, what attitude we've got that says God can't use me, but whatever it is, we've got to deal with it. Here's what Hebrews 12, 1 says. Love this verse. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. Everybody in here can be used of God regardless. I jotted some things down this week. I, if I'd have had time, I'd have actually enlisted some of these people and had them come stand up here and introduce themselves and tell you uh, in detail what I'm about to tell you. But here's just some ordinary people in our church. Now watch this. You've got Lee who said one day, I want to start a hospitality ministry that will feed people in transition. God uses her. You've got Dick who says, I know I'm new to the church, but I want to help run the bookstore. You've got Terry who said, I've never run anything for children, but I want to help run the Awana ministry in our church. You've got Stooney who says, I'm 90 years old, but I'll stand at the door and greet and I'll hug all the women who come in the door. When you're 90 years old, you can do that and get by with it, all right? We have a lady who comes every week in a wheelchair and sits in the cafe and helps and makes sure people have snacks. We have Mike who says, I'll be a part of the prison ministry and I go down to St. John's County and, and take a turn in a rotation to minister to all those guys who are in prison. You've got Rich who says, I'll take time every week to be in a praise ministry. You've got Doug who says, I'll be in the band and I'll practice and give my time to do that. You've got Brian who says, I'll commit my time to sitting back there and running the same ministry, a, a thankless job. You've got somebody like Barbara who comes to me and says, I got an idea. Let's start a, a, a thing out in the foyer and just put a ton of books out there so that people can check them out free, don't even have to buy them, and they can take them home to read it. That was a year ago, like this week. You've got somebody like Amelda who says, I want to help organize our small group ministries and get them going. Listen, these are just normal, ordinary people in our church that says, I want God to use me to make a difference in my world. Now guys, we've got to have an attitude that says, I'm willing to be interrupted. I'm willing to let God take whatever he's given me and use it in any way he can. Here's the third principle, okay? If I want God to use me in a great way, here's number three. I must be willing 
to do what I can, when I can, as often as I can. Did you get it? A lot of us, uh, we're, 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 we'll sign up for something big. I'll go overseas, I'll do this, I'll vocationally do that. But what God says, I want you to do something right where you are. What I love about this story is these guys aren't preachers, they aren't traveling. These are four guys in a local town who had one of their friends. Matter of fact, you could say it like this. You got four guys that carried the pallet and one guy that rode the pallet. Sells me like a small group. And so these four guys carry one guy in their small group and said, we're going to get him to Jesus. They just said, I'll do what I can, when I can, as often as I can. I can't heal him, but I can get him to Jesus. I can't fix him, but I can tear a hole in the roof. I'll do what I can, when I can, as often as I can. That's the attitude it takes to really be used of God. And think about this. It was their faith. The faith of four friends who got their friend to Jesus to be healed. Who in your life is waiting on you to carry them? Here's the fourth thing if you really want to be used by God. If I want to make a difference, I've got to be willing to work with others. No such thing as a long range Christian. I'm not in this by myself. I'm going to work with us. Now, I want y'all to answer this question out loud with me, okay? Everybody answer it out loud. How many people did it take to get this paralyzed guy to Jesus? How many? Four. I put the answer up for you right there. Everybody, how many people did it take? All right, thank y'all. All All right, took four. One guy couldn't drag him down the streets. They couldn't get him on the roof. Four guys working together. Uh, We do most of what we do through teams and small groups. Matter of fact, some of you are brand new in this church and you're hearing me talk about small groups. What are that? That's a small group of people who meet together in somebody's home and during the week they can watch a video uh, Bible lesson and then sit around and talk about it and get to know each other. In the first service this morning, I looked down, hadn't even planned on it. I looked down right there on the second row was a woman named Connie, one of the senior citizens of our church whose husband died about a year ago. And I remember Connie came to me last year. Connie came to me and said, uh, Jack, I've never done anything like this in my life. I've never led anything. I've never been a host of anything. I've never, I, I don't know that I can do this, but I really would like to have a small group meet in my house. And I said, we'll help you. We'll help you know what to do. It'll be fine. She opened up her home. She had so many people in her small group. I told her one day, we're going to have to start calling yours a large group. Because it's not a small group anymore. And, and God used her in a great way, okay? So some of you are new to this church. You've just moved into a new area, a new community in this area. And you said, well, what can I do? Have you ever wondered why God put you in that new community? Well, you got a house sitting right there. Many of you got a new house because you moved into Nocte. God put you right there. And right off the top of that, you can say, well, I can open up my front door so that once a week, for one hour a week, I can let a couple other couples come sit in my house. And they'll provide me with the materials and everything I knew. And we can sit there and get to know people in my community. Maybe God put me in this community to make a difference in people's life. I'll do what I can, when I can, as often as I can. And I will be willing to work with others to make a difference. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We work together as partners who belong to God. Hey guys, here's the bottom line. As long as people are trying to reach people for Jesus, I'm cool with it. That's what it's all about. We just want to reach people for Jesus. Any way we do it, any shape we do it, any place we do it, any fashion we do it, anybody who leads it, I am cool and great with it. As long as we're winning people to Jesus. The competition in this world is some is Satan and evil in a secular society. And we need to bombard that with all the energy we can. And Ecclesiastes says this, two can accomplish more than twice as much as one. We've got to be willing to work together. Let me show what can happen when people are willing to work together. Last spring, we had 52 small groups in this church. 52 groups of small groups of people that were meeting. And we asked each group this last year to do Micah 6, 8 
projects. Every group was asked to do a project. Let me just tell you some of the things that some of those groups did. We had a group that provided makeovers and cosmetics to the women at Hubbard House, which is a shelter for abused women. We had a group that provide clothing and household items for Hospice House, which runs a thrift store and uses those funds to provide hospice services to families who are going through a death. We had a group that created and sent care packages to troops who were protecting a school in Afghanistan. We had a group that supported the St. Gerard campus in St. Augustine with diapers and food and other baby items. We had several groups that supported the juvenile arthritis walk because we had a girl in our church, Megan, who was suffering from that. And she led so many of our small groups. And her group was raised over $11,000 and had 100 people involved just in her group. A group collected a huge amount of personal items for the Betty Griffin home, a shelter for abused women. We had a group that put together 60 what they called resurrection baskets, school notebooks, pencils, folders, coloring books, gospel tracts, even skittles for low-income housing community over in the Arlington area. We had a group that supported the Gabriel House and the Mayo Hospital and, and took lunch to those patients that were getting chemotherapy. We had a group that supported the Schulzbacher Center with toiletry kits. We had a group that supported Beam, the Beaches Emergency Area uh, uh, Emergency Assistance Ministry. All of these ministries were done just by small groups of people who said, we will work together to make a difference in the world. And you know who gets the credit for doing that? I'll show you. The Bible said, Jesus said, Mark 9, he says, Jesus said, if any one gives even a cup of water, the, the smallest thing, if you even give a cup of water because you belong to me, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. Now, here's what I'd like for you to do just for a second. Imagine yourself. Visualize yourself in this story. And the person you are is that guy laying on that mat. You can't move your legs. You can't move your feet. You're completely paralyzed. But you got four buddies who care about you. And they come and stand alone beside you. God has put them in your life. And they're willing to be interrupted. They're willing to do whatever it takes to get you to Jesus so your life can be changed. Now I want to ask you this. Who is it in your life that needs you to get involved in order to make that Jesus can make a change in their lives. There's some of you have people in your life, in your sphere of influence, that somebody like me will never meet, never talk to. But God has put them in your life and you're the person that can get them to Jesus. My question to you this morning is, are you willing to be that person? Are you willing to get involved to do it? I'll give you an example. On November the 4th, coming up, uh, that's the day we're going to move our clocks back. That's going to be the day we fall back and everybody gets an extra hour sleep, okay? It's late this year, all the way into November. So, you know what the new thing in Jacksonville is right now? This guy, Shad Khan, went and bought the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's got one of them big old black handlebar mustaches. That thing goes from ear to ear just about. So, their new theme for the Jaguars this year is, I'm all in. He gets on television, I'm Shad Khan, I'm the owner of Jacksonville Jaguars, and I'm all all in. You get the coach, Mike Malark, he gets on. I'm the coach of the Jaguars and I'm all in. They get all these players come on television. I'm so and so with the Jaguars and I'm all in. Here's what I want to throw out to the church this morning. Are you willing to stand up and say, my name is so and so and when it comes to the work of God, I'm all in. You can count on me. So on that day, when you had planned to get an extra hour of sleep, here's what I want to ask you to do. Are you going to be willing that day on November the 4th to say, I'm going to find somebody and bring them to Jesus? If I have to carry them on a mat, if I have to drag them through the streets, whatever, I'm going to bring them. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have big old black mustaches made and give to everybody. 
I'm going to give you all a big old mustache. And on one side, I want you to write your name. And on the other side, I want you to write the name of somebody you want to bring to church, bring to Jesus that day. And we'll see who God touches and affects that day in their life. What a neat thing it would be for you to be able to say, you know, I invited my friend to church. And God came into their life that day. Or God started a process that day. I can't tell you how many people, if, if I were to go pointing out people in this room and have them stand and say, tell about the fact you came to Crosswater one Sunday. You came one Sunday and God started talking to your heart and you came back. And since then, God has changed your life. Wouldn't it be neat if you were the one who brought the next friend and you saw God work in your friend's heart? Are you willing to say, God, I want you to know when it comes to being used by you, I'm all in. You can count on me. I want us just to bow our heads for a minute, close our eyes. And I want us just to take a minute to pray. Before you can be used by God, you have to know God. And he has to live in your heart. And the wonderful thing is God so loves you that he's paid the price for you to be forgiven and have a personal relationship with him. Right now where you're seated, you can pray and say, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. Just right there, you don't have to say it out loud. You can just whisper in your heart and say, God, I want you to live in my heart. I want to know you. I want a personal relationship with you. Forgive me for all the mistakes and the sins that I've made in my life. Give me a relationship with you. If you'll pray that prayer and mean it, God will come into your heart. And before you leave today, I want you to take that tear off on your bulletin. On the back, there's a place for you to check and say, I prayed that prayer with Jack to invite Jesus into my heart. And you just drop it in the basket when you leave. For the rest of us this morning who know Christ, would you be willing to pray right where you are and say, God, I want to be all in. I want you to use me in a great way. I want you to use me to do what I can, when I can, as often as I can. If you need to change my attitude, if you need to interrupt my agenda, do whatever you need to do, God, I want you to use me. God, just the thought that you can use us in our lives to make a difference in our world is, is spellbinding. And we just want you to use us. You've allowed us to live. You've given us what you've given us. Not just to make money, not just to have a comfortable life, but to make a difference in our world. And I pray that you would use us all across this room, us as individuals and us as a church, to make a difference in people's lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you look this way just before you leave today, I want to share just a couple of things with you that are important in the life of our church. I want to just give you a couple of updates on some things that are happening in the church. We won't be long, but let me just share them with you. For a period of time, our personnel ministry team and our deacons and I have been working with our student pastor, Travis Berkey, regarding the direction that he felt like God wanted him to take in his life. Travis had indicated to us for some time that he had felt that God was leading him to become a lead pastor, a senior pastor, and possibly to plan a new church. We've been meeting with Travis recently and talking to him about how the best way to go about pursuing that direction was. This past week, Travis shared with us that he felt like that he needed to go ahead and submit his resignation as our youth pastor. And he said, I'm doing so because of personal convictions, and he shared those, and because I can give my entire focus toward becoming a lead pastor and planning a new church. And so he submitted his resignation to be effective next Sunday morning, the 9th of September. And as a church, we always pray that God would use us all in reaching people for Jesus, whatever it took. While Travis was not asked or encouraged in any way to resign, we do want to support him and his efforts to follow God's direction in his life. And Travis believes this is God's next step for him in his life. He'll continue to work here at the church this week. And he'll go with the kids and the students to the Night of Joy in Orlando this weekend.
And next Sunday will be his last Sunday of service here. At the end of the second service next week, we'll have an opportunity to host a reception for him over in our youth room, and all of us will have an opportunity to participate in a love offering for Travis. Uh, when we had a change in our worship pastor position, we started having conversations with Barry Blaze about leading our music during the interim time. Many of you have seen Barry. Uh, stand up over there just for a second, Barry. Uh, Barry has been leading us. And uh, many of you, if you were here the first Sunday Barry was here, saw the CNN report uh, where Barry had had a, a serious motorcycle accident and almost lost his life. He did lose most all of his hearing. That's why if you're new, when he's playing, he's got those headphones on. It's the only way he can hear and uh, hear what's going on here. And so we've been talking to Barry about being our interim music worship leader while we're looking for a permanent uh, worship leader. And in the process of talking to him, we realize there's certain limitations because of, of the physical issues that he has from his wreck. And so we had also met a guy named Bill Sloan. And Bill just happened to be standing here. He's playing the guitar. Bill has been a music minister in the past. He's also been a youth pastor. And now he's been serving as a senior pastor of a house church out in the World Golf Village. And he and Barry had worked together. So we'd been talking with Bill about working with Barry uh, in our interim music situation uh, to help with some of the things Barry didn't feel comfortable that he could do. And so when Travis told us that he felt like God was calling him in this direction, uh, Bill said to us, I could help uh, with, the, with the interim with our students. And so we began to talk to him. We actually had a meeting, me and, and Bill and, and Travis uh, met recently, and we began to talk about a transition for our students uh, in our student ministry because there's high priorities we have in our church. So uh, we have asked uh, Barry to begin immediately serving as our interim uh, worship leader, and we've asked Bill to begin serving as our student worship leader. And so when Travis's responsibilities come to a close, then Bill will assume those responsibilities. Neither of these gentlemen are candidates for the permanent position that we're looking for, but they have both committed to help us during this interim period. Our personnel ministry team will work with me. Our personnel ministry team will be filled out by the end of September, and we will conduct a nationwide search to find God's person to lead us in our student ministry and to lead us in our worship ministry. We don't have who, any idea who that would be. We have not talked to a single person about either our student ministry or our music ministry. Had no conversations with any individual about this. We don't know who God will lead us to, but we know this. God will lead Travis and bless him in his life as he seeks to follow God's direction. And God will lead and bless our church as we seek to know his will and to follow him too. And, and all of us are 100% confident that the best days for Crosswater are still in our future. And I want you to know that I am personally committed to being all in and being totally committed to, to leading our church family and to seeing God accomplish everything he wants to accomplish in our church. So you be in prayer for all of these and prayer for our church and we'll continue just to seek the Lord and let God's blessings fall on our church, all right? Thank you so much for coming today. God bless you. Have a great Labor Day weekend. God bless.